Hello everyone and welcome. In this video we're going to be checking out Biology Paper 1, 9700, Variant 1 of May, June 2022. And this is the MCQ. There are timestamps in this video for you to skip ahead to any specific questions you'd like. And of course, in the, the comments, you can write down any comments, questions that you have, and we can answer those. Also, if you have any resources for notes or anything that you'd like to share with any uh, with all other Biology AS, maybe a two students that are here, of course, feel free to th share those. This, this way we can help out together as many biology as students as possible so let's get started question number one a student used a stage micrometer scale to calibrate an eyepiece graticle. The diagram shows the view of both the stage micrometer scale and the eyepiece graticle seen by the students. The divisions of the stage micrometer are 0.1 millimeters apart. The student moved uh, the student removed the stage micrometer scale and viewed a white a, a slide with blood cells on it. The um, same lenses were used so that the magnification remained unchanged. The student measured the diameter of one of the white blood cells on that slide using the eyepiece graticle and recorded that it was eight eyepiece units. What's the correct diameter of the swab blood cell in micrometers? So in micrometers, in order to figure this out, there is. Uh, so we're going to start basically by identifying what's uh, written. So zero point the one stage micrometer unit is zero point one. They're zero point one millimeters apart, right? So this is zero point one millimeters in length, and also the number of microscopic units that occupy this length. Are 40 because 50 minus 10 that's 40. That means that 40 eyepiece graticle units are 0 0.1 millimeters apart, then one will be x millimeters apart. So, in other words, we can divide 0 0.1 by 40, and then this is the length of one eyepiece graticle unit, and multiply that by 1000 in order to convert from millimeters to micrometers because the stage micrometer scales are 0 0.1 millimeters apart and from millimeter to micrometer is times 1000 if you want to convert back to millimeters you have to divide by 1000 and that's and then of course you have to multiply by the number of eyepiece graticle units occupied by the white blood cell because he said if, if we know that one eyepiece graticle unit is going to be the length that is 0 0.1 divided by 40 which is millimeters it's going to be x right and then you have to figure out the number of i uh, like the length of the white blood cell and you're going to have to multiply the number of eyepiece graticle units occupied by the white blood cell by the length of one eyepiece graticle unit right and so here we multiply this by eight so that is c which is 20 micrometers Four students were asked to match the function with the appearance of some cell structures in an animal cell. The functions were listed by number and the appearances were listed by letter. Which student correctly matched the number function with the appearance of a cell structure? Okay, so number one, the mRNA passed through to its ribosome. So mRNA is going to pass through the nuclear pore to the, to the ribosome and from the nucleoplasm and into the cytoplasm. And that's going to be the nucleus, right? So the, the, the structure is going to be the nuclear envelope or let's say the nucleus. And here we can see X describes the nuclear envelope perfectly because it says a double membrane interspersed with pores, which is exactly what the nuclear envelope is. So one is X. Number two produces mitotic spindle during cell division. So two is obviously the centriole, or I'm sorry, the centrosome. And centrosomes are non-membrane bound cylindrical structures, and that's gonna be Y. So two is Y. And then three packaging of hydrolytic enzymes that will remain inside the cell. So that should be the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which could be described by either Z or V because V describes it as membranes which are surrounded by an enclosed cavity and that is exactly what the reticulum is and same thing for Z because it says membrane bound sacs arranged as flattened stacks. All right, yes, exactly. And so let's look at what we have in options. Do we have X? No, we have X, Y, Z, perfect. Moving on. Number three. Which size range would include most prokaryotic cells? So that's this B, because they are going to be from 0 0.5 micrometers to five micrometers in, the, in length. Now, what, so what is present in a typical prokaryotic and typical eukaryotic cell? So, 70 S ribosomes sure in chloroplasts in mitochondria and all prokaryotic cells, the 70 S ribosomes. Centrioles, no, it's not even found in most eukaryotic cells, only in animal cells. Uh, circular DNA and uh, in the cytoplasm, not in the cytoplasm. We have circular DNA in our mitochondria, in the plant's chloroplasts, but not in the cytoplasm. So that's wrong. Starch granules, again, that's wrong. And the answer is A. Moving on. 
Number five, which statement about viruses is correct? They all have a capsid made of protein. They all do, that's correct. They all contain RNA, that's wrong. There are two types of viruses, retroviruses, which contain RNA, and adenoviruses, which contain DNA. And so we, not all viruses are gonna have RNA. Some of them will have DNA. They all have an outer envelope made of phospholipids. That is not necessarily true. Yes, viruses, when they burst out of cells, they're going to take part of the phospholipid bilayer of the cell surface membrane of the cell with it because it's going to be released by exocytosis or like bursting if you would imagine that and you still imagine the phospholipid bilayer remaining on the surface of the virus but that's not true for all viruses because the virus that first infected the cell wasn't like this now they all contain ats ribosomes actually they do not contain any ribosomes they do not contain any organelles to begin with that's why the answer is a now six Samples of glucose, sucrose, and a mixture of glucose and sucrose were divided into two halves, M and N. M was tested with Vendix solution, N was boiled with dilute hydrochloric acid neutralized, and then tested with Vendix solution. The color of the solution was compared to color standards. Which table identifies the correct color changes for these samples? Okay, so we identify that uh, they, they basically, basically contain, uh, there's M and there's N, and basically we have a half that was basically only done with Bendix test and a half that was tested for non-reducing sugars. So this is only tested for reducing, however this is tested for also non-reducing sugars. And so the results for N are only going to be positive when there's sucrose or a mixture. So let's see. Uh, and actually this is supposed to be like in the positive because this is reducing like for glucose. And um, let's see, so for M, a uh, glucose sample will be yellow. Okay, sure, uh, because sucrose will be blue, mixture will be yellow, that is true. Okay, glucose will be yellow, uh, sucrose will be yellow. Okay, I don't think so, because um, yellow, it's supposed to be like red, considering that it is, oh no, it's yellow because it's only sucrose, it's correct, okay. And then red, that is true, exactly. Now, why would it become red here? This is the this is why this is this is wrong. And despite being correct here, however, it's wrong in this point because why would it increase in concentration when you just dilute it and boil with hydrochloric acid? It wouldn't do that. So let's move on. Number seven. Which molecules contain one four glycosidic bonds? So one four glycosidic bonds are found in amylose, in cellulose, and in glycogen. They all contain one four glycosidic bonds, despite them being different. In cellulose, we have one four beta glycosidic bonds. In um, amylose, we have one uh, one four alpha glycosidic bonds. And same thing for for glycogen. Let's move on. For number eight, the diagram shows three triglycerides X, Y, and Z. Which row is correct for these triglycerides? Contains saturated fatty acids. They all contain a saturated fatty acid uh, so i would suppose x y and z it contains unsaturated fatty acids it's only found in x and y because this uh, this drawing represents a double bond and double bond is found in only unsaturated like there are only there's only one double bond in each fatty acid right so basically this double bond is found in each fatty acid, right? But basically, this double, like there are no other double bonds in the fatty acid chain within the chain, unless it's unsaturated. Otherwise, it's saturated, like this one, this one, this one, and that one. Okay, uh, contains more than two different fatty acids. So more than two different fatty acids. We can see here that there's two of those that are the same. However, this one is different, so I would not say it contains two or more different fatty acids. However, for um, X and Y, we can see that this is different to this one and that one and that this is different to this one and that one and so on so it's supposed to x and y so the answer is a now for number nine some foods contain hydrogenated fat vegetable fats these are unsaturated fats that have a uh, been converted to saturated fatty fats interesting so which property of these fats will change the hydrocarbon chains will fit closer together exactly just like you saw in the diagram above you'd see that the hydrocarbon chains don't fit so close to each other when they are unsaturated and another way to imagine this is basically if you have an unsaturated one and then basically it's going to branch out in a different way because of the double bond. However, basically, there's another fatty acid right here, and it cannot just fit so close to it because it's just straight up. So they're not going to fit so close to each other, and there'll be spacing between them, and that's why the answer is right here. The solubility in water will increase. That's not true. They'll have more double bonds in their molecules. No, actually, they convert from unsaturated to saturated. That means they've lost the double bonds and we've hydrogenated them, okay? Because when you are sat unsaturated, you have fewer hydrogen atoms, right? But then when you hydrogenate them, you give them hydrogen atoms they need to stop being unsaturated and could be converted to saturated fatty, fatty fats now they will remain liquid at room temperature that is also not true 
A polypeptide contains a specific number of amino acids in. How many peptide bonds are present in this polypeptide? So if you draw an amino acids, you understand that there's like, and there's also, so there's a number of amino acids. And we know basically that between each two amino acids, there is, okay, hold on. Yeah, between each two amino acids, there's only one double, only one peptide bond, right? So if I, I'm just gonna draw this to be clear for you. So C and then R and then N, H and H. And then basically here we're gonna have C and R, and you can imagine the rest right here. So the, between two amino acids, we have only one. That means it's two minus one, hence it's N minus one. Now which statement is correct? Amylase, or ribose, and phospholipids are all macromolecules. Ribose is not a macromolecule, so that's wrong. Cellulose, glucose, catalase are all polymers. Glucose is not a polymer, so that's wrong. Okay, dioxyribose, fructose, and ribose are all monosaccharides. That is true. Okay, and sucrose, dioxyribose, aminopectin are all polysaccharides. Dioxyribose and sucrose are not polysaccharides. Hence the answer is C. We're moving on. Um, a student to use the color meter to monitor the hydrolysis of a protein by the protease enzyme. The student used the biorite solution to determine the concentration of protein in hydrolysis reaction. The student produced the calibration curve using known concentrations of protein. Which diagram shows the calibration curve? Well, as the protein concentration increases, the percentage of absorption is going to increase. Because when we test it using biorite, we know that the positive result for biorite solution is turning from blue to purple. Purple is a darker color, and when you have dark colors put in front of light, they absorb most of this light and hence the percentage absorbance is going to increase and that's what because it's, because the purple is going to become darker as you increase the concentration you're going to have it even be increasing in absorption and that's why the answer should be b uh, the, these two answers do not make sense like maybe if you got confused and thought that the protease solution was placed into the what's it called the 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 um, covet while we were testing it with the coloring meter then this is not what happens it's just a calibration curve we just you set some unknown concentrations of protein and we add the biorate solution i mean known concentrations of protein let's say 0 0.2 0 0.4 percent 0 0.6 percent and we test them with biorate solution and then we put we use, uh, like cal cal and then we use a color meter in order to calculate the percentage of absorbance and once we're done we just produce this curve and then we carry out the test on the unknown concentration of the protein and we see the percentage of absorbance and once we got that we use the calibration curve to identify the protein concentration of the unknown solution okay that's why it's b now for 13, a student compl completed an experiment to measure how increasing concentrations of substrate affect the rate of an enzyme-controlled reaction. The student then repeated the experiment after adding a fixed quality quantity of a reversible competitive inhibitor. Which row describes the effect of a reversible competitive inhibitor on enzyme activity? The attachment of the inhibitor at the active site, that is true. The competitive inhibitor will compete with the substrate for the enzyme active site because it has a similar binding site, a similar shape to the substrate's binding site and hence it's going to, as I mentioned, bind to the active site of the enzyme. Uh, effect on increasing subs of increasing substrate concentration on the rate of the enzyme controlled reaction, it is going to increase. Now, because we know that um, you know the longer the con this is the shape of the graph, then we can see like with substrate concentration, and here is enzyme activity. Okay. As you increase the substrate concentration, you are, well, this is the graph when you have an enzyme and substrate and a little bit or a lot of the competitive inhibitor. And this is the graph with only the enzyme and the substrate. And basically when you add it, you can see that the substrate concentration will result in increasing the enzyme and act activity back to the Vmax, right? But basically it is going to and, and why is it going to do that? It's because substrate concentration, as you increase it, you're going to increase, obviously, the competition of the substrate. Like, it's going to win the competition because the enzyme is not going to be so distracted anymore because there's much less uh, inhibitor available in front of it, right? So that's B. For number 14, uh, the diagram shows a liposome, and liposomes can be used to move therapeutic drugs into cells of the body to treat conditions such as cancer. And um, which row shows the property of a drug that could be transported into sections of the liposome labeled one and two? Okay, basically, the, what can be transported in layer number in layer two is a hydrophilic substance because of the hydrophilic heads right here. They're pointing towards me, right? So whatever is in here is not going to be repelling those; it's going to be attracting them. So it has to be hydrophilic. However, in location two, along the hydrophobic fatty acid chains of the phospholipid bilayer and layer one i mean that should be hydrophobic obviously and so i'm sorry this is location one this is location two location two should be hydrophilic location one should be hydrophobic moving on 
Some processes occurring in cells are listed. So which processes use ATP and synthesis of water into cells? Sure, if this happens in cells, and this is, then obviously it's energy consuming. Same thing for exocytosis of enzymes from the cells and facilitated diffusion of glucose does not require energy. It's a passive process. Phagocytosis of dead cells by macrophages. Obviously it requires energy. So that's one, two, and four. Now, okay, question 16. The graph shows the changes in the concentration of the solute, solute inside the cell. What explains the change in this concentration? So obviously you could see that it's decreasing over time. That means it's leaving the cell or otherwise the water is entering the cell, right? So basically what explains this change in concentration? You could say diffusion. Obviously you cannot say endocytosis. You can say exocytosis because it's leaving the cell. So by any mechanism that involves leaving, short thing. And osmosis because water is moving in. So one, three, and four is B. And the indicator crystal red changes from red to yellow when put into acid. Four blocks of agar containing crystal red were cut into different sizes and measured in millimeters. Uh, the blocks were submerged into acid and all the variables were constant. The time taken for each of the blocks to run to turn completely yellow was recorded. Which of the four blocks became yellow most quickly? So here we don't really need to calculate the surface area to volume ratio because of option A. As you can see, there's such a large width and height or whatever these values are actually. And then you have such a tiny value here right so that shows basically that this is going to decrease diffusion distance ever so much that it doesn't matter the surface air to volume ratio anymore because obviously we know that it's going to have a low surface air to volume ratio right but we also know that it's going to have such a short diffusion distance to the point that it's going to turn yellow the most quickly so that's a so in the recent questions in the recent years like i would also advise to calculate the surface air to volume ratio but in the most recent years they only focus on the fact that you recognize there's a short diffusion distance and for the letter a obviously you have the shortest diffusion distance as compared to the height in the next unlike the letter c and so on so 18 which processes require mitosis the cloning of t lymphocytes short during clone expansion the repair of cell structures by protein synthesis uh, sure basically the repair of cell structures by protein synthesis does not require because cell repair cell uh, like basically Basically, repair of cell structures does not require mitosis because it's cell division. Why, is, why do we have to repair them by cell division? That doesn't make sense. The growth of one cell organisms form from a single cell. Uh, that is true. That is true. If it's acellular, I'm sorry, in, um, in unicellular, then obviously this is wrong. The reproduction of unicellular eukaryotes, asexual reproduction, obviously. So one, three, and four, which is B. Now, which events listed are part of the cell cycle? Interface, prophase, cytokinesis. Well, part of the cell cycle, uh, I would say yes, all of them are part of the cell cycle. But if, if he was to ask about mitosis, that it will only be prophase because these are only part of the cell cycle interface and cytokinesis. Now, telomeres are and is an and telomerase is an enzyme that adds nucleotides to telomeres. The which statement about telomerase is correct. A high concentration of telomerase in cell damages genes during DNA replication. Actually, no, it helps to make, make sure DNA is not damaged because of cell division actually and DNA replication. High concentration of telomerase in cancer cells limits the rate of tumor growth if tumor growth actually no the reason why cancer cells are able to divide so quickly is because they have lots of telomerase and if you increase the concentration of telomerase they're able to divide even more and it actually doesn't have much to do with the division as much so like i will not associate it really with like oh the higher the concentration of telomerase the higher the rate of tumor growth the low concentration of telomerase in stem cells means that these cells can divide an, an unlimited number of times uh, actually, no, it has to be a high concentration of telomerase. The low concentration of telomerase in body cells means that these cells can divide a limited number of times. Exactly. The photo photomicrograph shows, cell, shows cells at different stages of mitosis. So a student wrote four statements about the photomicrograph, which statements are correct. Right, so we can see uh, cell P shows anaphase, that is correct, okay. Spindle forming is occur uh, formation is occurring in cell Q. Uh, cell Q, as we can see, is like undergoing... Okay, so we can see that this is like maybe telophase, right? There's like formation of the nuclei again, I think, and decompensation of chromosomes. I would not say spindle formation, I'd say spindle breakdown. Okay, the amount of DNA in cell R is the same as in cell T. In cell R and cell T, yes, that is correct because they are both cells that are going to go in mitosis. They're genetically identical. At this moment, they do not have, they both have undergone DNA replication. So I would say uh, three is correct. This is the correct order of stages is S R T P Q. So S is interface that is correct. The uh, chromosome that we can see that the nuclear envelopes are present and everything. And then we have R, which you can see the nuclear envelope disappeared and the chromosomes have condensed and they, they're very much clearly visible. And then T, which is so we start with interface and then R is prophase. T happens to be 
metaphase followed by P which is anaphase and Q which is telophase so that is correct because we already know the order which is P mat and of course interphase is the beginning interphase is the preparation phase followed by P mat so that is why 4 is correct so 1, 3 and 4 which is C moving on Okay, number 22, bacteria cells with DNA containing only the heavy isotope nitrogen of nitrogen N15 are allowed to reproduce for three generations in a culture medium containing the normal isotope of nitrogen N14. What percentage of DNA molecules produced contain strands with heavy isotope of nitrogen? So we have to understand that with every generation, the number of DNA strands that contain the heavy isotope of nitrogen is going to half. Now, starting up, we only we only have N15 and making up both our strands, so it should be 100% as our starting uh, percentage. Okay, so this is correct. And the sec second percentage should be half of that because we know that now when the DNA application is going to happen, since it's semi-conservative, the first strand is going to be maintained, which is N15, but next to it will be a strand made of N14. The new strand will be made of N14 because the culture medium is entirely N14. So where else would it get its nucleotides from to be N15? So that should be why it's going to be halving, which would be 50. And then the third generation is going to be the half of that, which is 25. And if you cannot visualize that, you can immediately just draw it so first we start with two strands one and one two two strands and 15 the first division will, will happen and so we have the first strand is going to be maintained and a new strand which is made of n 14 will be added again same strand and then a new strand made of n14 now initially this was 100 percent right it's two out of two multiplied by 100 is 100 however now we have two out of four multiplied by 100 that is 15 and if you want to go ahead and look at the next Okay, so the rest. <laughs> okay, so we can see also this is the last third generation, right? And you can see that there's two out of eight only are N15, right? And so two out of eight multiplied by 100 is actually 25%. And so we can see 150, 25, the answer is C. Okay, for question number 23, a bacterial circular DNA molecule is 2,600,150 2, base pairs long. 26% of the bases are adenine. How many cytosine bases would be in the DNA molecule? Okay, so first off, we have to pay attention to the point about base pairs because this is very confusing for a lot of students is that they think that this is the amount of nucleotides available. However, this is the amount of base pairs present. Therefore, the amount of nucleotides would be times two of this. Okay, because the total number of pairs is not the same as the total number of nucleotides, if you get my point. And so first off, you will have to multiply 2,600,150 by two. Okay, and multiplying that by 2, you should get 5,200,300. Uh, now, we understand that 26% of the bases are adenine. So we multiply this to, understand, to know how many bases are actually adenine. And 1 million, I'm sorry, yeah, 1,352,078. Now, this is the amount, this is the number of adenine. Um, and, and, and base is present and so we multiply this by two because we know that according to complementary base pairing rule adenine and thymine will be in equal proportions one to one in the entirety of the dna molecule and so if we multiply this by two you should get two million seven hundred and four thousand one hundred and fifty six adenine and thymine now if we subtract the, the number of the nucleotides total from the number of adenine and thymine bases we can go ahead and we can get the number of cytosine and guanine bases because these are what remains since and the, there are adenines cytosine twine, thymine and guanine these are only the four the four bases present and so we can calculate this by subtracting five million two hundred thousand three hundred from two million seven hundred four thousand and one hundred fifty six which will give you two million four hundred ninety six one four Four. And according to complementary base pairing goal, this is half cytosine, half guanine, since they pair up with each other on both strands. And so if we divide this by two, we should get the number of cytosine bases present, which he wants. One, two, four, eight, zero, seven, two, which is C. Which statement relating the structural structure of DNA is correct? Two strands of DNA are drawn together by phospholipid bonds. No, the two strands of DNA are paired like 
are basically running against each other by hydrogen bonds. The element of basis to form a double helix is only achieved between anti parallel strands, that is correct. Okay, zero hydrogen bonds are formed between all base pairs containing purines. No, 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 because we have purine adenine and it forms two hydrogen bonds with thymine, right? And the number of cytosine bases is always equal to the number of thymine bases, absolutely not, as we have seen in the first example. That's why the answer is B. 25. A student sketched a diagram to represent the process of transcription. Which part of the diagram shows non-transcribed DNA strand? So the non-transcribed DNA strand is a strand that was not copied. And you can see here this strand is the one that is copied, right? So that's B is a transcribed strand. However, A is non-transcribed strand. C is just a, a region of the DNA. And D is the mRNA, or let's say the, what's it called? Um, yeah, it's the primary transcript. Now for 26, which row is um, which row is correct for the movement of water in a roots? So pathway, a plus pathway, through which cellular space is a molecule present in the experience subrain. This is totally right. However, a plus pathway through plasma is matter, wrong, so plus pathway, that is correct. And the molecule of the experience strip is lignin, is not lignin, right? So basically it's a plus pathway through intercellular spaces that's wrong, therefore the answer is A. What is the experience strip? Basically, if you look at the endodermal cells of the root, and these are like the cells that are present in the endodermis tissue, they're going to have this molecule called superine, which is going to be found in their cell wall. This is going to need, be needed for regulation of water movement as the plant grows older and other functions, obviously, but basically it's uh, it's found only in endodermal cells and it contains superine. Superine is a waxy chemical that is going to be waterproof and a barrier to the movement of water. 27. Uh, the table shows some information about the uptake of water, uh, uptake and water and movement of water and of, and of mineral ions in plants. So using the information provided, which factors would affect the uptake of water, of movement of water or of mineral ions in plants. So we understand that the uptake of mineral ions is going to be by active uptake, and that's what he mentioned right here. And we understand basically that the movement of water is going to depend on not only basically the mechanism of uptake, which is osmosis, it's also going to depend on transpiration, as they mentioned, evaporation, diffusion, right? So transpiration aeration, cohesion, adhesion, all this type of stuff. And what affects transpiration is basically like humidity, right? So basically surface area of the root hair cell is going to affect both movement of water by osmosis and the ion uptake by active transport. Oxygen concentration is going to affect aerobic respiration, which affects active transport. Temperature is going to affect transpiration, hence the answer is A, 1, 2, 3, and 4. 28, which changes to the water potential and the volume of the solution in the flow sieve tube element occur? And so, of course, it's moved from a photosynthesizing leaf into the flume sieve tube element. So, the water potential is going to become lower and the volume is going to increase. And that's, as I mentioned, like this is just loading, right? From the source region, what happens basically is that you have the cell of the source and it's going to be providing the sucrose to the companion cell who's going to be providing it to the sieve tube element. And obviously, when you provide sugars, the water potential is going to decrease. However, obviously, the overall volume is going to increase. 29. Student wrote the following statements about the possible mechanism for loading sucrose from a source. And when energy is released from ATP, the release energy is used to move sucrose through a cold transporter protein in the companion cell membrane. That is false because it is known as indirect active transport. The energy released from ATP is needed for the active transport of hydrogen ions out of the cytoplasm of the companion cells and into the cell wall, and not for the sucrose to be moving through cold transporter proteins. Right? The energy released from the movement of hydrogen ions out of the cell wall back into the companion cells. Right, basically is going to release its energy, enough energy to co-transport the sucrose back into the cells. And that's basically indirect active transport. This energy is needed for the pumping of hydrogen ions and not for the sucrose co-transportation. Okay? So as sucrose is moved into companion cell, the pH in the cell wall of the companion cell decreases. Well basically if it's and yes, the pH in the cell wall of the companion cell is going to decrease. Well Okay, that, is, that could be true, uh, sure. Okay, because the like, hydrogen ions are going to be pumped into the cell, cell a companion cell wall such that the um, sucrose can be moved back, and that makes sense, yes. Proton pumps in the cell membrane of a companion cell move sucrose into the fluent sieve tube element. Well, that is wrong, and so the answer is D, 2 only. The diagram shows the transverse section through an artery, which tissues are present in layer X. So layer X contains elastic fibers, collagen, and smooth muscle. Normally, we'd say only elastic fibers and smooth muscle, but in these years, like 2019, 2022, for some reason, he keeps adding collagen. Okay, 31. What is the static blood pressure? It's the maximum blood pressure in arteries, which is C. Okay, and diagram uh, shows the pressure changes on, on the left side of the heart. 
and are worn to over time. The length of the cardiac socket is 0.6 seconds, 0.1, 2, 3, and 4 indicate when the atrioventricular valves and terminal valves are either open or closed. And so, what is the total time for during one cardiac socket that the atrioventricular valves and terminal valves are both closed at the same time? So, we can here write the like basically when they're going to be closed and when they're going to be. Uh, yeah, when they're going to be open. So we know basically here the atrioventricular valves are going to be closed, similar valve open, right? And atrioventricular valves, similar valves closed, atrioventricular valves open. In order to know it's the total time that they're both closed at the same time, is to count the time from here all the way until this is open because until it's open, obviously the similar valve is going to be closed. And so it means basically that from 0.0. .0 14 I'm sorry 0 0.012 until 0, 0.0 I think this is um, 0 0.05 15 yeah basically and then from here same thing on the other side from close to open and if you count the time right here and add it to this time over here which is 0 0.03 seconds you should end up with 0 0.07 which is answer C 33. Which reactions take place in the capillaries surrounding an alveolus? So in the capillaries surrounding an alveolus, we can obviously draw the red blood cell and see what happens in the capillaries. We know that carbon, that basically carbon and uh, carbon acid is going to dissociate because the hydrogen ions. Uh, I'm sorry. So hemoglobinic acid is going to dissociate when it reacts with oxygen, releasing hydrogen ions and oxyhemoglobin. I'm sorry, <laughs> four and this is eight. And then basically the hydrogen ions are going to be reacting with hydrogen carbonate ions, which are going to be moving with facilitated diffusion out of the site, out of the, the tissue, the red blood cell, I'm sorry, blood plasma, and into the red blood cell. And then hydrogen carbonate ions, when they react with hydrogen ions, they're gonna form hydrogen carbonic acid, right? I'm sorry, H2CO3, right? And basically, Carbonic acid over here is going to dissociate into carbon dioxide and water, and that is where carbon dioxide is going to be released back into the alveolus. So carbon dioxide and water to carbonic acid, not happening. Carbon dioxide and hemoglobin to carbon hemoglobin, not happening because carbon dioxide is being released and not reacting. Uh, hemoglobinic acid to hemoglobin hydrogen ions, true. Hydrogen carbon ions plus hydrogen ions to carbonic acid, which is, yes, that is exactly what I said here, which is, I'm sorry, uh, three and four, which is, okay. 34, which statements is to explain the importance of chloride shift to red blood cells. The carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood plasma into red blood cells, and chlorine ions diffuse out of red blood cells to maintain the balance of positive and negative ions. Okay, so basically, importance of the chloride shift in the red blood cells. We can see basically that carbon dioxide is going to diffuse from red blood plasma into red blood cells, and chloride ions diffuse out of red blood cells to maintain the balance. And this is not really, it doesn't really matter for carbon dioxide. What matters here is that we are so I'm discussing hydrogen carbonate ions because they are going to be affecting the overall charge right, of the plasma membrane when they diffuse out of the red blood cell by facilitated diffusion. And so hydrogen carbonate ions diffuse into the blood plas into plasma from the red blood cells and chloride ions diffuse into our blood cells uh, to maintain the balance of the positive and negative ions. That is correct to the answer here would be. Okay, now 35, the photomicrograph shows a cross section through the lining of part of the respiratory system. Which statements about the photomicrograph are correct? Goblet cells are visible between squamous epithelium cells, obviously not. So they're not squamous epithelium cells, they're pseudostratified columnar epithelial cells, right? And we cannot describe those as squamous. Squamous, squamous epithelium cells are found in uh, the alveolus, right? So basically, alveolar walls, you can see something like this, squamous epithelium cells with their nuclei, but columnar cells that have cilia and everything these are definitely not, not squamous, okay? Smooth muscle is, is visible, yes, we can see smooth muscle. Okay, the section cannot be from a bronchiole as the cartilage is visible, that is correct. You can see cartilage and lacuna and everything, so it's two and three, which is D. The surface tension in the layer of liquid lining, the alveoli tends to pull the walls inwards so alveoli could collapse. Okay, which statements could explain how this is prevented? Alveolar fluid is moved around by cilia, there is no cilia and alveoli. Elastic fibers give the alveoli open, that's not the function of the elastic fibers. The elastic fibers are needed for elastic recoil and basically, I'm sorry, uh, recoil and basically for, you know, stretching out the walls of the alveoli during inhalation, but not for keeping the alveoli open, okay? And if cilia cells secrete chemicals that reduces the cohesion of water, yes. 
The epithelial cells secrete a chemical known as a surfactant. The surfactant is going to be made of phospholipids, and these basically phospholipids are going to obviously reduce cohesion because they're hydrophobic, right? I mean, they have hydrophobic parts, so the answer is three only, which is D. What will reduce the rate of bacteria become resi becoming resistant to antibiotics? So, prescribing two antibiotics with different modes of action through prescribing different antibiotics for the same bacterium, of course, prevention the prescribed course of antibiotics, and that's what we do to patients who have tuberculosis. They actually give them um, actually at least three antibiotics and obviously they have different modes of action and they're going to be given at the same time it's just because we want to make sure that every single bacillar or bacterium inside his body is going to be killed and that's why the answer is one two and three a and if cells have a protein pd1 on their surface some cancer cells have a receptor a molecule on their surface which binds to pd1 and activates an ethylene beside the monoclonal antibody lambro blah blah has been produced against this receptor trials show that 54 out of 135 people with advanced skin cancer who were given this thing uh, which is basically Body, these tumors have more than half the volume. In six of 57 people who were given the highest dose, the tumors disappeared. What may be correctly concluded from this information? Uh, this binds with the receptor on, on the surface of skin cancer cells. Well, actually, yes, of course, like it's gonna bind to this receptor that's gonna inactivate the T lymphocytes, and that's how basically people are recovering because the T lymphocytes are no longer deactivated. Cancer cells, which uh, lymphocyte is bound, cannot act and activate exactly. And lymphocyte targets and kills uh, skin cancer cells. Well, we don't really know that. It has, it has multiple modes of action. It can be killing, it can be agglutinating, it can be different things, but mainly we care that basically it stops inactivation, so we cannot truly and correctly conclude that uh, basically allows patients of own immune system to kill cancer cells i mean yes exactly that's how because the telium cells are not inactivated so they're just gonna carry out and um, you know the humor not the humoral the cell mediated immune response the t killer cells are gonna carry that out so it's one two and uh, four only which is b39 uh, a person's blood group is determined by antigens present on the red blood cells a uh, table shows antigens and antibodies in the blood of people who with different blood groups during a blood transfusion it's essential for the person receiving the blood does not have antibodies to the donor's blood and which blood group can be given to a person with blood group a b so because the table can sometimes be confusing make sure to memorize what people who can give who right so basically remember that um, o can give any blood group so it's the universal donor and a b is uh, their universal recipient and it's going to be taking it from taking blood from any person right obviously we're not talking a b plus and plus and minus that stuff we're just talking here a b a b o in general okay so basically a uh, can be given like blood can be given to blood someone who has blood group a can take blood from someone with blood group a or o someone with blood group b can be taking blood from blood group b or o someone with blood group a b can take it from a b o and a b right someone with blood group o can only take it from O. Oh. And so basically, which blood groups can be given to a person with group AB? As I mentioned, all of them. And so the answer is D. Now, I am going to be providing a blood chart in order for you to memorize if you do not want to rely on the information provided. However, I do recommend that you read the charts and try to understand it because this will help you in case there were some tricks. Maybe they listed A plus, B plus. I will also provide you with A plus and B plus charts just to, you know, be safe. But now let's just try to understand if you do not want to memorize. So blood group, so first off, he tells you what the blood group is and the presence of A or B antigens on their blood cells. So you can see that the red blood cell, with blood, if, if you were in blood group A, is going to have an antigen that is like A only. However, in the blood plasma, there's going to be antibodies for B. So if you were to give someone with blood group A, uh, blood, blood, blood B, you know, blood type B, they are going to be rejecting this blood. And the reason for this is because they have antibodies against it. And so they're going to be destroying their blood cells if you give it if you gave it to them and so th this is one way to understand it. however different things are going to happen there will be different complications because of giving someone their own blood type but the most important thing is that to understand that okay anti b is going to be attacking blood group b that's why we cannot give someone blood group a anti uh, basically blood, blood type b right and then same thing for what you call the blood b you cannot give them a blood type a because they have anti a antigens only Blood group O is going to have anti A and anti B, so can only accept blood groups from what from blood group A O because I'm if we basically thought that oh why not A B why can't why can't A B give it to them because A B has A and B antigens on its surface and antibodies for blood group O actually are anti A and anti B, so they're going to be attacking both these antigens so that they're going to be like if you imagine this is their blood cell for A B. 
and they have these antigens this is type let's imagine these are a antigens and these are the b antigens right and so what happens here is basically the antibody is going to come that is complementary to this and the anti-b is going to come and it's going to be attacking this and that's for blood group o if you were to give them a b type and so when he asks about what blood group can be given to a person with blood group a b well we see that it has not not any type of antibodies for you know basically any other blood type so you can give it any blood group okay that doesn't matter you can give it any blood group because it's not going to be attacking anything and so this is why we can get it A, B, A, B, and O. It's known as a universal receiver. However, O is the universal donor considering it doesn't have any antigens for what's it called, you know, and, on, and for any other blood cell. So you can just give it to anyone and there will be no attacks from their blood onto the, their new and received blood type. As you can see, a plus sign can take blood from any type of blood however if there is a minus sign it can only receive from the minuses and don't forget that a b can receive from all types of blood however uh, uh, basically o can only receive from o and that a can only receive from a or o same thing for b it's from b or o and now which types of cells are stimulated by the divide by cytokines produced by t helper cells so we have macrophages are stimulated yes okay but oh stimulated to divide no it's only b lymphocytes and t killer cells that are stimulated to divide however macrophages are stimulated to carry out like basically to kill the pathogen i hope this video was useful if you found this please make sure to share it with all the friends who need the help in Val.js and um, good luck everyone!